Curio. In the waning years of the 1800s, in the bustling corridors of American politics, Congressman Ignatius L. Donnelly took an unprecedented diversion. Backed by the wealth of knowledge housed in the Library of Congress, a repository of history's riches established in 1800, Donnelly embarked on a quest not of politics, but of antiquity and mystery. His focus shifted the whispers and echoes of a lost civilization, the enchanting tales of Atlantis. His research ventured where others hadn't, blurring the lines between imagination and scholarship, revitalizing ancient narratives for the modern seekers. Donnelly penned Atlantis, the antediluvian world, a tale seemingly at the crossroads of fiction in academia, yet it struck a chord in the hearts and minds of a burgeoning 20th century audience. It is one of the very reasons why today this story echoes in our literature and film. But where did he get this story from? And is there any truth to it? To tell this story, we need to travel to Egypt, back 2,600 years to around 600 BC. The story is said to have been inscribed on pillars in a temple in Sais, an ancient Egyptian city. Solon, an Athenian statesman and lawmaker, visiting Egypt is credited with bringing the story of Atlantis back to Greece. The Egyptian priests told Solon, that the events of Atlantis occurred approximately 9,000 years before, which would place the events around 9,600 BC. The tales of Atlantis meandered through time, passed among wise men and scholars eventually down to Plato, who in 360 BC cast this ancient narrative into the annals of history, etching the enigmatic stories of Atlantis in the dialogues of Timaeus and Critias. From this rich historical tapestry, a pivotal question emerges. Was this intricate tale spun from the loom of allegory? A fabrication wielded to illustrate philosophical ideals and to critique the hubris of civilizations? But what if nestled within the folds of this allegorical narrative lies a strand of truth, a genuine foundation that hints at a civilization once grand, but now lost to the depths of time and ocean? It's one hell of a story, isn't it? So why has it not just faded into history as myth and fable? Perhaps to begin with, it's Plato's unusual deviation from allegory, insisting that this peculiar tale was grounded in truth, coupled with explicit details on its whereabouts and timeline. And here's where the tale takes a riveting turn. Our strides in modern geology and scholarly pursuits are not just echoing, but amplifying Plato's ancient revelations almost affirming that he wasn't merely crafting a story, but was onto a groundbreaking, monumental truth that we are just now beginning to grasp. So let's start with the first of the opening clues to its location and look at what Plato said geographically in his description. For in front of the mouth which you Greeks call, as you say, the pillars of Heracles, there lay an island which was larger than Libya and Asia together, and it was possible for the travelers of that time to cross from it to the other islands, 
and from the islands to the whole of the continent over against them, which encompasses that veritable ocean. Here's what we know. Plato describes the Atlantic as once navigable, with an enormous island situated beyond the Pillars of Heracles, what we now know to be the Strait of Gibraltar. His reference to the Sea of Gibraltar being a harbor and not the true ocean is suggesting that when he references beyond, he is saying to go west. And go west, we shall. As we sail westward from the Straits of Gibraltar, where waves sculpt an ever-changing tapestry below, whispers of ancient civilizations echo in its deep blue canvas. We are immediately struck by Plato's reference to a navigable ocean. This term paints a vivid picture of a vibrant maritime route, now starkly contrasted by the cataclysm that rendered the ocean impassable, encapsulated in Plato's words, the island of Atlantis, disappeared in the depths of the sea, for which reason the sea in those parts is impassable and impenetrable, because there is a shoal of mud in the way, and this was caused by the subsidence of the island. This phrase beckons us to consider fluctuating sea levels which might have unveiled paths previously submerged, fostering a rich, interconnected civilization before tragedy struck. As we delve deeper into Plato's narrative, we encounter a remarkable claim regarding the size of Atlantis, described as being as large as Asia and Libya combined. It is essential to pause here and ponder on this assertion. During Plato's time, the geographical boundaries of Libya and Asia were vastly different from contemporary delineations. Libya referred to a region encompassing North Africa, excluding Egypt, while Asia, in this context, likely encompassed the western part of modern-day Turkey. The juxtaposition of these regions to define the size of Atlantis, however, may suggest a degree of exaggeration, commonly used in ancient narratives to emphasize grandeur and magnificence. Further into the text, we encounter the mention of an island situated within this navigable ocean. This detail seems to narrow down our scope of investigation, focusing on a distinct landmass that stood apart, substantial yet not spanning into a continent. It holds a promise of clues to a civilization with defined boundaries, yet one that held sway over a considerable territory. The narrative then brings to light a series of islands that could be reached from the central island, Atlantis. It paints a picture of a thriving maritime route a hub of cultural exchange, trade, and interactions that spanned across these islands, bridging distant lands and fostering a rich, interconnected civilization. Plato tantalizingly hints at a pathway extending beyond these islands, leading to a whole continent on the other side. This brings forth the grand image of an extensive maritime route facilitating interactions with lands possibly corresponding to the Americas, an idea that predates the historically accepted time of their discovery as it was thought that the New World would be undiscovered until 1492. In Timaeus, we find Plato's detailed account of the Atlantean Empire's territorial ambitions. This ancient powerhouse, according to Plato, expanded its influence beyond its primary island, reaching into the heartlands of Europe and Africa. Such a significant geopolitical maneuver Considering the sheer logistics, infrastructure, and communication networks required to maintain and expand such an empire, their homeland's location would have played a pivotal role in facilitating these grand expeditions. So, in order to sharpen the focus and drive this investigation deeper, I'll be zoning in on this specific area of the Atlantic, right here. This will be the epicenter of our continuing search for answers. truly grasp the mystery of Atlantis, we need to go deeper 
to decode the signs left behind on the seabed. As if Atlantis once stood tall, traces of its grandeur may yet be etched in the very bedrock below. And so, below we must go. As we traverse the hauntingly beautiful depths of the North Atlantic, it becomes unequivocally clear that the ocean floor is far from a barren wasteland. Here, amidst the undulating valleys and towering ridges, a vibrant tapestry of geological activity weaves a complex and intricate narrative. Our journey takes a turn towards the enigmatic Mid-Atlantic Ridge, a seismic masterpiece sculpted by the hands of time and tectonic forces. To truly grasp the magnitude and beauty of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, one need not restrict their explorations to the depths of the ocean. In Iceland, this geological marvel strides boldly above the sea, offering us a tangible glimpse of the forces shaping our Earth. Here, the North American and Eurasian plates drift apart at a rate of about 2.5 centimeters per year, a slow yet constant movement that shapes the very ground beneath the nation's feet. Through dramatic rift valleys, seismic activity, and geothermal phenomena, Iceland stands as a living laboratory, illustrating the awe-inspiring raw power and the formative processes of divergent tectonic plates in action. Here, in this underwater mountain range that bisects the ocean floor, lie many riveting clues waiting to be unearthed that might shed light on the mysteries of the sunken land masses that we seek. This underwater mountain range, stretching over 16,000 kilometers, stands as a witness to Earth's dynamic and ever-changing nature. The dance of tectonic plates doesn't merely reshape the continents, it crafts the very fabric of the ocean floor. At the heart of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the seafloor is in a perpetual state of rebirth. Divergent plates pull apart, and in the void they leave, magma rises, cools, and solidifies. This phenomenon known as seafloor spreading is an evolutionary tale told in rocks and magma. With every inch the plates diverge, new crust is birthed, forever changing the tapestry of the ocean's bed. This dynamic interplay gives rise to hydrothermal vents, which spew mineral-rich fluids, warmed by the Earth's interior. As with any tale of growth and transformation, the Earth too carries its stretch marks. These geological scars crisscross the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, recording a history of dynamic vertical movements. These marks serve as evidence of the Earth's lithosphere being pulled apart. Growing, contracting, and shifting in response to the mantle's turbulent activities below. Imagine for a moment if we could drain the vast waters of the Atlantic. What marvels would be unveiled? An intricate labyrinth of valleys deeper than the Grand Canyon, mountains rivaling Everest in stature, and vast plains that stretch endlessly, all sculpted by eons of tectonic ballet. Amidst these natural wonders, perhaps, the ruins of ancient civilizations long lost to the embrace of the deep, roads, citadels, and monuments reminiscent of a time when they basked in the sun's glow. The true scope of what lies hidden is beyond comprehension. It makes one ponder, could the legendary Atlantis be concealed within these submerged realms? As we set our sights on the chapters ahead, our quest takes on an even more profound dimension. We're not merely searching for a lost city but navigating a world where every grain of sand and every rock formation could be a key to unlocking the grandest mysteries of our past. As we examine the rock formations sprinkled across the Atlantic Ocean, a startling discovery comes to light. Certain rocks bear the unmistakable signs of once having been part of a landmass above water. They found this out by studying the types of carbon and oxygen in the rocks. These specific types can only be found in rocks that were once above the ocean, exposed to rain and soil. 
This discovery suggests that this piece of land had moved up and down a lot, sometimes being under the water and sometimes being above it. However, this piece of land did not seem to move in the same way as the ocean floor. This finding hints that there might be a submerged block of continental land in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. This was noted in a 1975 article in New Scientist. They just presented their findings without making any big claims about discovering a legendary landmass. Every nook and cranny, every sediment feels like it's telling a story. Almost as if the ocean floor is trying to share its secrets with us. Think about it. The sediments on the ocean floor, they're not just mud and particles. They've got history. There's this electric moment when you realize that some of these sediments These very grains might have once been part of grand mountains, tall trees, or meandering rivers. They might have felt the warmth of the sun and the rustle of the wind. And the more we uncover, the louder these echoes from the past become. Every discovery feels like a puzzle piece, nudging us closer to a picture that's been fragmented by time and ocean currents. Whether it's remnants of ancient rocks or the unique layout of underwater terrains, everything seems to hum a lullaby of an era gone by. A time when, maybe, just maybe, Atlantis thrived. In our quest to understand the mysteries surrounding Atlantis, we first delve into the Gulf of Cadiz. Positioned to the west of the Iberian Peninsula, the Gulf's allure lies in its diverse bathymetry. Given its location near the Strait of Gibraltar, there's an argument that it could have served as a bustling maritime route. Additionally, several underwater anomalies and formations have caught the attention of researchers, suggesting possible remnants of ancient structures or cities. We voyage to the Madeira Archipelago. Situated northwest of Africa, Madeira's hypothesis finds its strength in ancient accounts and the region's intriguing geology. The archipelago consists of volcanic islands, hinting at cataclysmic events in the past that could correlate with Plato's account of Atlantis's downfall. Furthermore, the strategic placement of Madeira in the Atlantic would have made it a potential maritime hub, resonating with the descriptions of Atlantis as a bridge between continents. Venturing further southwest, we approach the Canary Islands, an archipelago of seven main islands, have long been enveloped in tales of lost civilizations. Ancient ruins, artifacts, and the presence of the indigenous Guanche people bolster the island's connection to a storied past. There's also the volcanic geology to consider, the dramatic landscapes of the islands, with their high peaks and deep valleys, could align with certain aspects of the Atlantean descriptions. While each of these locations offers intriguing possibilities, several counterpoints warrant consideration. Firstly, the proximity of the Gulf of Cadiz, Madeira, and the Canary Islands to the Iberian Peninsula in North Africa would likely mean that if Atlantis were located there, it would have been more widely known and documented by ancient civilizations. In essence, instead of being a mysterious and distant land, it might have been considered an integral part of the known territories, much like how regions close to Greece or Egypt were well mapped and referenced in historical accounts. Additionally, given the relatively shallow continental shelves of these areas and their strategic maritime importance, there would likely be more extensive archaeological findings if they were the heart of a vast Atlantean empire. But most importantly, we need to revise Plato's Critias for it describes the scale of what we are looking for in great detail. He provides us with detailed dimensions, landscapes, and structures that this lost city once boasted. Firstly, let's convert the ancient Greek units of length referred to as stadia. A stadia referred to the length of a stadium as approximately 185 meters. We can create several points of reference, scale and direction, and start to visualize what Plato was writing about. Plato delves deep into the very fabric of the city, describing it not just as an island, but as a mosaic of landscapes. He sketches a land with concentric rings, 
alternating between water and land. The central island, a circular heartland, spans five stadia. It's encircled by a moat of water, one stade wide. This aquatic belt is followed by the first ring of land stretching two stadia. Beyond it, a second watery ring, two stadia in breadth, unfolds. Finally, the outermost ring of land spans three stadia, culminating in a diameter of about 4,200 meters. From the core of this city, a channel carves its way nine kilometers long, bridging the central island to the vast embrace of the sea. It's no doubt impressive in scale, around the size of Lower Manhattan. But as we zoom out, it becomes clear. The challenges in looking for something this size on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. We must expand our gaze to the encompassing sizes referred to for the entire island. Behold, the Great Plain, a vast, flat landscape with dimensions truly remarkable. Stretching out 3,000 stadia in length and a width of 2,000 stadia, this magnificent plain is nestled within a protective framework of mountains. To the north, these mountains shield it, forming an impenetrable barrier, punctuated with rivers, nurtured by rainfall and springs. I can almost visualize what once was. The sprawling expanse of the Great Plains, to the west, formidable, precipitous mountains rise. Northern hills roll gently, acting as nature's sentinels. At the heart of this enchanting landscape sits the majestic city, harmoniously cradled by the embrace of the island's natural beauty. We inevitably find ourselves returning to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. The ocean floor here is dotted with intriguingly named seamounts, a collection of extinct submarine volcanoes that trace a path along the ridge's outer edge. This chain of underwater mountains was formed, as the African plate moved over the New England hotspot, leaving behind these fascinating remnants of volcanic activity, culminating in an expansive plain that extends all the way to the Azores. This cluster of islands might just hold more secrets than meets the eye. Nestled here is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, a sprawling geological marvel known for its volcanic activity. Could this very ridge hold echoes of the cataclysmic events Plato spoke of when he described Atlantis? Now imagine an island, mountainous terrains encircled by the ocean with a central plain surrounded by highlands. Sounds familiar? That's because the topography of the Azores bears an uncanny resemblance to Plato's descriptions of Atlantis. In recent years, a series of intriguing findings have come to light from enigmatic stone structures reminiscent of ancient European megaliths to a curious pyramid-like formation on the island of Pico. The remnants seem to beckon us to look closer. Plato further mentions the mountains to the north, which sheltered the populace from the aggressive tendencies of the Atlantean central power. These northern people play a critical role as observers of the island nation's ultimate demise. According to Solon, where is who the ancient Egyptian priests heard the story from? Given the geographic descriptions Plato provides, placing these northern mountain dwellers in the region of the Azores becomes a tantalizing hypothesis. If we entertain this notion, then perhaps these very individuals, living on the periphery and sheltered by the mountains, survived the cataclysm that consumed Atlantis, carrying with them the memories of a once great civilization. could have migrated to other lands, including Egypt, sharing their stories with the civilizations they encountered. Over millennia, these accounts became embedded in the annals of the Egyptian priesthood, waiting for the day they'd be shared with an inquisitive Greek named Solon. Curio.